Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey. So my name is Carson Straub. I'm not sure why I gave you my full name. Um, but I'm a senior here at Grace. I am super nervous because I don't speak in front of people. I'm going to sit. Is that cool? Yeah. So this is my senior chap, Cole. And um, a lot of people for their senior chapel, they choose to do more worship. Um, like an hour of worship, which is great, or they just throw communion in because it's something like that everyone like agrees we should do, or you know they do something. Where, well, I wanted to speak, and I really am questioning why I wanted to at this moment <laughs> <laughs> because I'm not really eloquent. I really get flustered when I speak in front of a lot of people. It's nice that the lights are so bright, so I really can't see you. Yep. Um, so I'm kind of like squirming right now, but. I really wanted to impart to you something that matters to my chapel um, and something that I think is important for all of us as Christians and important for all of us as we strive to follow Christ. So um, I'm going to start today um, a prayer and then we're going to get into the Word. So would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to worship you and know uh, more about you, Lord. Lord, we truly want to see you, Lord. We want to know your heart, Lord, just as you want to know our hearts. And uh, as you reached out for us, Lord, give us strength to trust you, that we might know that we can have no fear in you, Lord, and that we can have um, lives that are changed, that can bring glory to you, and that can uh, uplift your name, Lord. Uh, give us strength to do these things, and all things may be praised. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, if you have your Bible, you must stand up and talk around because you've got the passage too. Um, if you would turn to John 4, now I don't problem you, a lot of you don't have your Bibles, that's fine, I never did. Um, but I know you have your phone, because that always happened me. So, just if you have a Bible or your phone, go to John 4, and uh, we'll be studying from there this morning. So John chapter 4 is all about Jesus meeting a Samaritan woman. And I know a lot of you grew up in church, you know this passage probably really well. So you're going to always say, I know the scripture, but I'm just going to recap it really quick. Um, so John chapter 4 starts with Jesus leaving from Jerusalem, he's talking with the Pharisees, and he is going to Galilee. Now, um, it says here in verse chapter 4 that he had, uh, yeah, verse chapter 4 they had to go through Samaria. This was uncommon for Jews to go through Samaria. They didn't want to interact with Samaritans. They were half Jews. They were kind of just you. So they didn't want to interact. But Jesus chooses for whatever reason to go through Samaria. And as he waits there by a well, his disciples leave him and he is all alone. And it, uh, at one point, a woman comes up to the well and she begins to draw water. Now Jesus says he was thirsty, and so he asked her, can you draw me some water as well? And she's confused with this because Samaritans and Jews don't interact. And she asked him, sir, how can you ask me to draw you water? That's not something you would do. Why would you do this? And Jesus kind of flips her. He doesn't really address her question. He just kind of goes right at her. And he says, if you asked me for a drink, if you knew what I had, you would be asking me for a drink of what I had. And this woman says, sir, it's kind of ridiculous. You don't have anything to draw the well. This is a deep well. You don't have a bucket. How are you going to get water? And Jesus, once again, kind of dodges around this question. He says, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become to him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now that is super crucial for us to understand clearly, that verses uh, 13 and 14. We must know that passage and exactly what it means. A lot of times we interpret this passage as God's talking about living water and he's talking about our salvation. He's talking about eternal life and we just kind of take it that. But you can see if you read close, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about something that wells up to eternal life. This living water isn't just something that we attain at a later date, but it's something that we presently can have in Christ today. And so this woman goes on, she says, Sir, give me this water so I won't ever get thirsty, and I won't have to come, keep coming back here to draw water. And Jesus says, Go back and call your husband, and come back. And she, of course, responds, I have no husband. And Jesus says, Of course, you're right. He knows everything. He knows that she has had five husbands, and now she's with someone that is not her husband. 
And we see the symmetry in this passage, how she wants to not have to come back to the water, uh, we don't have to come back to the well to keep drawing water up from it. And yet she continues to seek and other things and go back to old practices again and again, not realizing that it's just like the water. She has to keep drawing from it. She will never be satisfied. One man after another, she'll never find satisfaction. And how often we do this with our own lives? Because we read here, we've read this passage. I know you guys have all read this passage before. You've all heard this passage before. And yet I know there are key things in each of our lives that we continue to draw back from. We continue to go to because they're convenient, because they're simple, because of what we just have and whatever. We know Christ. We are okay. We have salvation. Okay. But this passage is truly impacting us. The point that Jesus is trying to make is that with Christ, we don't have to go back. We don't have to continue to say, I need to go back to this well. He truly says right there, whoever drinks the water I give him will never be thirsty. This woman's progression through the passage is pretty awesome. Because she goes from verse 7, first meeting Jesus and being like he's just one of the Jews. Verse 19, she confesses, yes, you are a prophet, you're someone. And later on, as Jesus speaks more, in verse 25, she says, yes, I know that you are the Messiah. How amazing is that? In a span of minutes, God transformed this woman to knowing that he is a regular person, to knowing that, for she knowing that he is the Messiah. And how often he does that in our lives, that we realize that Jesus is not just someone that has a part in our lives, but he is everything our lives are about. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come that you might have life, and life abundantly. That you might have life to the full. It is so crucial that we understand that Christ's purpose for us is not just to have salvation, but have an amazing purpose on earth, in our lives. It's at this time that we can always remember that we didn't always have this opportunity. That it was Christ reaching down to us first. That we had the opportunity to be made alive. That's what my chapel theme is all about. We are made alive. We are made alive for a specific purpose. We aren't just made alive so that we can have something in the future. We aren't just made alive so we can feel better. But we are made alive so that we can no longer have to keep going back to the things that once held us down on earth. That we can be changed. We can have a future. I see it in my own life so often that I just keep drawing back. Keep going back. It's simple. I know it's simple for you guys as well, because, I mean, we're all here together, and I see you almost every day. Well, maybe not. I'm off campus. So <laughs> commuters are a part of the citizens here. Um, except for those chick fil Amen. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about three things that we as college students, I think, really struggle with, that are our wells, so to speak, that are the things we keep drawing back to, we keep going back to, because they're simple, and in the place we are in life right now, it's really easy. And the first one is insecurity. There are so many people that are just like us here. And so many opportunities we see them. I remember my freshman year, I am a really insecure person as it is. And my freshman year, I remember there was a group of friends that I really wanted to hang out with. And uh, it was with my roommate, Cody. I don't know where he's sitting. Hey, what's up? Hey, what's up, buddy? <laughs> we were roommates. And I was really insecure around Cody because Cody was really cool. And Cody hang out with cool people, and then Cody moved out and left me. And, uh, <laughs> and I was super insecure, and I was like, I want to be friends with him. I want to, he, he'll go out to the movies with Sergio. And I'm like, oh man, why did they invite me? What's wrong with me? <laughs> and I felt so insecure, like, gosh, I don't know why I am the way I am. And that root of insecurity is, I wish I was better and I wish I had this, and am I not good enough? And that's a huge thing when you want to get into a relationship. You want to see someone as special, and you see them as the greatest thing ever, and then you think, what if they don't think that about me? And the most amazing thing is, with God, we don't have to think that. We don't, there's no way that we can think better of God than He thinks of us. He already thinks we're the best thing in the world, that's why He died. 
We don't have to be worried about where we stand with God. We don't have to be insecure that He might not take us for who we are. Oh, you don't know what I've done. God, God really does know. I, he knows what you've done. It's okay. And He's willing to take you on right now and change you and give you that life. The second thing is jealousy. And it comes right off of insecurity. We not only see what we don't have and what we lack, but we see someone who has what we want. We say, oh, if only I had that, my future would be better. If only I was, I thought that in high school a lot. I played football. I know. It doesn't look like it. Um, <laughs> it really doesn't. And I was like, man, if I only, I was like, you know, this guy in Jason, he's 6'4 and 215 instead of 5'11 and 7'8s and 110 or 150 or whatever it was. I don't know. It was, it was small. Um, <laughs> but... Wanting what I didn't have didn't make me a better football player. And seeing things that we can't obtain doesn't bring us closer to who we want to be. It only reveals to us what we lack even more. In Christ, we don't have that. God has said He's equipped us with every good gift, that He's given us everything that we need to be successful in His kingdom. That we lack nothing, that we can fulfill His will for our lives without having to worry, do we have enough? Does that person have what I don't have? I wish I was a good pastoral major speaker, like Cody, but I'm not. I kind of stutter, and I speak really fast. If I'm talking too fast, please let me know. I really think I am. You're good. <laughs> um, and the last thing is built off of, but is the building block of both these uh, other things that we struggle with, and it's pride. We want to be in control of our lives. We go to college so that we can say, my future is this. We want to plan it out, and we want to say we have control of something. But in the truth, we don't have control. And the only control we can have is saying, God, you have control. That's the only control we can have. And so I encourage you, we're going to take some time in prayer here in the next few minutes. The lights are going to come down, and you're going to have an opportunity. The lights are coming down right now. <laughs> I like it. Um, and you're just going to have, it's not completely dark, but just take some time alone with God. Take a moment just to glorify Him, to be able to say thank you for the new life. To be able to reconcile the things in yourself that you often draw back to, you often go back to these wells. And you often say, I can just go back when it's convenient. God has given you an opportunity to not have to go back. God has given you the opportunity to have a new life. And He will be the one that works in you through all that. I know, for me, when I was in high school, I was like, I know I have this new life, but I don't know what to do with that. I'm going to ruin it. God is the guide that we have through our, our entire Christian lives. That we can trust and rely on that He's going to work in us. That we don't have to do it on our own. So if you would, take a couple minutes, pray, thank the Lord for what He's done, and be able to glorify Him in that.
you have made us alive, and we can worship you because of that. Let us continue to sing out. Amen. It's such an amazing opportunity for us. So this next song, it's going to have a lot of different things about God. Just continue to sing out and we'll have a good time.
story is a great reminder of the God's work in our lives. It means more to us than we usually can attribute. Uh, it says, you have lifted me up of the miry pit, out of the mud and the mire. You set my feet on a rock. You gave me a firm place to stand. You have put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. And then you will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man that makes the Lord his trust. He does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside from false gods. Thank you.
alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost with no hope, no place to be in. If your love made a way to let mercy come in, when death was arrested, my life began.
that you desire for us, Lord, that we might be able to see you, to serve you, and to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.